Hey friends, welcome back to the Animal Nerd Podcast. I'm your host, an eldritch abomination, and I am so happy that you're here. Today, we're taking a deep dive back into the early days of modern internet culture, to revisit what was, at the time, possibly the world's most beloved meme. That's right, today we're going to be nerding out about Keyboard Cat together, because there's a lot more to this story than most people realise, and as your resident animal enthusiast, it's my god-given duty to tell you all about it. We all remember Keyboard Cat, right? He was inescapable in the early 2010s, an icon of pop culture who seemed to have just always been there. There was no beginning to Keyboard Cat, no end, like a benevolent omnipresent deity bestowing serotonin upon all who bore witness to his musical blessings. I was 11 years old when Keyboard Cat first became popular, and while I can't remember where or when I first encountered him, I can tell you that that little musical riff has been living in my head rent-free ever since. But since there's probably at least one person listening to this who somehow has never heard of Keyboard Cat before, you poor, poor soul. Let me explain. Keyboard Cat, in its original and best known form, is a 55 second YouTube video of a fluffy ginger cat in a teal shirt, booping its little paws on a keyboard to a cute little tune which, if you listen to once, you will never escape, with an expression on his face that I can only assume is intense concentration as he gives the performance of a lifetime. I realise describing it doesn't really do it justice, so if you've made it this far through your life without ever experiencing the wonders of the first ever Keyboard Cat video, then I would highly recommend going and doing that now. But here's the thing about Keyboard Cat. He's not real. Or rather, Keyboard Cat isn't just one singular cat. Instead, Keyboard Cat is a title, a vocation, a folkloric hero, if you will. A mantle that has been passed from Ginger Tabby to Ginger Tabby over the course of four decades. Yes, the original Keyboard Cat video will be turning 40 years old this winter. So to tell the story chronologically, let's begin with the first ever Keyboard Cat, the cat who gave birth to the persona that we all know and love today. Her name was Fatso. And yes, although referred to almost exclusively as male in most media coverage, the original Keyboard Cat was indeed a female. I couldn't find out much about Fatso's life, other than that she and her sister Skinny were given to Charlie Schmidt and his wife by a friend. Their names were less references to their physical builds and more so to their fur, with Fatso being fluffy and Skinny being short-haired. Fatso, and presumably Skinny as I'm assuming they were littermates, were only about a year old when the now iconic video was filmed. But how exactly did this now iconic video come to be? Well, boredom, apparently. One of Charlie's friends had recently bought a camera, much to his wife's chagrin, and so a small group of friends were taking it in turns to film their own weird little videos. Charlie looked at his keyboard, his cat Fatso sleeping nearby, and a random teal baby shirt that was lying around despite the fact that he didn't have a baby, and thought, yeah, why not? So he pre-recorded a little ditty on his keyboard, put the shirt on Fatso, set up the camera, and then put his hands under Fatso's shirt so he could move her arms to make it look as though she was playing the keyboard herself. Yes, I regret to inform you that the keyboard cat does not, in fact, play of her own accord. I mean, I guess cats aren't generally known for their natural use of musical instruments, but we all know that Fatso is playing the keyboard in her soul. It only took two takes to get the video perfect, and after that it was put onto a videotape and put in a box with the rest of Charlie's wonderfully weird creations and everyone just went on with their lives. Fatso passed away in 1987, three years after the video was filmed and over 20 years before she became a meme. Fast forward to 1998. Obviously the most important thing about this year was that it's the year that I was born, but it's also the year that Charlie decided to show his two-year-old daughter some of the weird old videos he'd filmed. Only it turned out that over the years, many of the tapes had degraded to the point that the footage on them was at risk of being lost forever, so Charlie sets about the tedious task of digitalising each and every one of them, and when he's finally done, he shows them to his daughter and she loves them. In 2007, Charlie heard about this cool new website called YouTube, where you could upload videos and have them seen by people all across the world. So he figures that maybe there might be some more people out there who would enjoy his work. So he started a channel and uploaded some of his old projects. And one of these videos was, of course, Keyboard Cat, who went live on the 7th of June, although at this time the video was actually entitled Cool Cat. And like, to be fair, it is a very cool cat. Charlie certainly wasn't expecting any of his videos to go viral, and yet it wasn't long before Cool Cat started bringing in more views than he could ever have hoped for. We're talking 30 whole views a day. Okay, yeah, it's not that much. But it was way more than Charlie had anticipated, and it's also significantly better than the YouTube uploads of this podcast tend to perform, so I'm not really one to talk. Given just how famous Keyboard Cat became, it's weird to think that it wasn't an instant hit, but that's exactly what happened. I mean, sure, it had already outperformed Charlie's expectations, but 30 or so views a day is hardly going viral. It took two years for Keyboard Cat to start bringing in the big numbers, and in fact, that's also when Keyboard Cat became, well, Keyboard Cat. It wasn't until 2009 when Brad O'Farrell of the popular comedy channel My Damn Channel, or Omnivision Entertainment as they've since rebranded, came across the Cool Cat video and was inspired to create his own video. If you were online during this time, you'll remember that fail videos were considered like the peak of internet humour. 
I mean, they might still be really popular, but I'm too much of a grandpa for TikTok, so I have no idea what the kids are into these days. Regardless, Brad looked at fail videos, looked at Cool Cat, and thought, you know what would make these two completely unrelated things better? If they were related. So he took a video of a guy falling backwards down an escalator, and then cut to Fatso playing a bit of her jaunty little jingle, and uploaded it to YouTube under the title Play Him Off, Keyboard Cat. And the entire internet lost their freaking minds. Suddenly, the original Cool Cat video began pulling in tens of thousands of views every single day, and people began scrambling to make their own Play Him Off style videos, scouring the internet or their own home videos for fails. A meme had been born, and for Charlie Schmidt, his life would never be the same again. Currently, the original Cool Cat video, now renamed to Charlie Schmidt's Keyboard Cat, the original, is sitting at over 76 million views. Not bad for something that was intended to just be a bit of fun. Weirdly though, this wasn't the first time Charlie had gone viral. In the early 2000s, he became known for his nasal contortionism, which is something that landed him on a couple of TV shows, as well as some live performances and commercials. What is nasal contortionism, you may ask? I am afraid I can't really help you with that one. I cannot begin to find words to describe what is going on in those videos. You'll have to go and watch them for yourself. There are clips up on the Keyboard Cat channel. It is truly an experience. Although Charlie did receive some recognition for his nasal contortionism, even including a bit of international coverage, it was absolutely nothing compared to the instant fame that Keyboard Cat was catapulted to. I'm pretty sure the only people who know about it now are the people like me who found out about it through researching Keyboard Cat. And returning to the topic of Keyboard Cat, what do you do when you accidentally create a viral meme like that? Where do you go from there? Well, that's exactly what Charlie was asking himself. After all, Charlie wasn't some professional content creator. He was just a quirky creative guy who thought people might enjoy his stuff. He hadn't bargained for any of this, but now he had a video racking up millions of views and a torrent of emails proposing business opportunities. Only as he had no real experience in this world, he had no idea how to navigate it all, and how to work out which deals were worth taking. It's very easy for someone in that situation to be taken advantage of by unethical companies. Fortunately for Charlie though, he had someone he could reach out to for help. Ben Lashes was the son of a family friend, and having once been a musician, was now working in marketing in the music industry. He seemed to have exactly the right skill set to make the most of Keyboard Cat's popularity, and he was already an admirer of Charlie's creative projects. In fact, when Ben was a kid, he'd actually asked for Charlie's autograph. It was a match made in heaven, and with Ben on side as the official Keyboard Cat manager, they were ready to take the world by storm. Well, mostly. There was one slight problem. People wanted more Keyboard Cat, and certainly creating new content would have been the best way to build the brand. But that wasn't really feasible, as by this point, Fatso had been dead for 20 years. To Ben, the answer was obvious. Just get a new cat. Except that's kind of easier said than done when you consider what Keyboard Cat was required to do. I mean, the majority of cats aren't going to tolerate wearing clothes and having their front legs plonked on a keyboard. Most of them are going to, at best, run away and refuse to let you near them, or at worst, shred you. If they were going to have Keyboard Cat 2.0, they had to find a cat who not only resembled Fatso physically, but also in terms of temperament. And so Charlie made a list of every single animal shelter in the area, and drove around to each one of them every single day to see if they had any cats suitable to tread in Fatso's paw prints. And within only a week or so, he struck gold when he found Bento. Just like Fatso, Bento was a chonky ginger tabby, about a year or so old by my calculations. There were some physical differences, namely that Bento was much shorter haired than Fatso, and had a white chin and cute white paws, but apparently a lot of people didn't look too closely, because for a long time, quite a lot of people believed that Bento was the original keyboard cat. And while he may not have been the originator, Bento would certainly make the role his own. Bento's arrival was announced, of course, with a YouTube video. On the 12th of March 2010, Charlie uploaded Keyboard Cat Reincarnated. It featured him, of course, wearing a teal shirt and playing a keyboard, and had been deliberately filmed on an older camera to help mimic the style of the original. That's not to say Bento's debut was all derivative, though. The tune he was playing was new, and as well as his trusty keyboard, this new Meowstro I'm sorry, I couldn't resist was also tapping a beat on a miniature drum, as well as doing a little dance with his back legs. What a performer. Naturally, Bento's video did really well, and now stands over 14 million views, the second most popular video on the official Keyboard Cat channel, surpassed only by the original. And now they had a Keyboard Cat who was actually alive, there was nothing standing in the way of the Keyboard Cat brand and world domination. And by world domination, I of course mean lucrative business opportunities. Perhaps one of the best known of these was also one of their first, an advert filmed for a company called Wonderful Pistachios, who sell, and you'll never believe this, pistachios. Wonderful Pistachios initially reached out less than a week after Charlie Schmidt adopted Bento. In their initial offer, they wanted Charlie and Bento to work for free, basically using the typical we'll pay you an exposure BS that people still try to fob off creatives with to this day. Luckily though, they now had their manager Ben, who negotiated a proper payment. The ad featured Bento playing a keyboard in his typical fashion, although he was now wearing a green top instead of a blue one because I guess it's a more pistachio-y colour. There were a couple of CGI rendered pistachio notes on the keyboard keys, and when Bento tapped them as he played, they split open. 
The ad was so successful that it's now the third most viewed video ever on the official Keyboard Cat YouTube channel, and the company continued to air it year after year. And, of course, every time they wanted to relicense the use of Keyboard Cat's image, they had to pay again. And all in all, for the ad and some extra promotional stuff they went on to do, including a cross-country tour in 2011, the Keyboard Cat team made, I think, somewhere in the region of $150,000, if my calculations are correct. And let this be a lesson to all creatives out there as to why you should never give in to companies or individuals who want to exploit your talents and make you work for free. Over the following years, Bento would feature in several other ad campaigns for a range of different products, as well as being featured on all kinds of websites, TV shows, and print media. One of the companies Keyboard Cat featured in was for the Shelter Pet Project, which was a public surface campaign initially launched in 2009 to try and encourage people to adopt animals from shelters rather than buying them from breeders or pet shops, and to counter some of the negative stereotypes around shelter animals as being somehow inferior to purchased pets. Because of course Bento himself was also adopted from an animal shelter, specifically Spokane County Regional Animal Protection Services. In addition to all their extra work, Bento and Charlie were still regularly making new content for their YouTube channel, including Keyboard Cat's own take on other memes, like David After Dentist, Gangnam Style, and Rebecca Back's Friday. There was even a Keyboard Cat version of a Rickroll. Honestly, if you've never spent a couple of hours just trawling through the older videos on the Keyboard Cat channel, I really recommend it. It's just the thing if you want a little boost of serotonin or nostalgia. Keyboard Cat tried to run for president in both 2012 and 2016, but unfortunately he never got far, as I'm guessing being human is probably a requirement. I mean, I don't see why. I feel like a cat certainly couldn't do a worse job than some US presidents. Meanwhile, Ben Lashes was realising that he was pretty good at this whole meme management thing. He'd actually quit his job to pursue working with Keyboard Cat, but seeing the potential in his business model, he began to reach out to other people who'd found themselves becoming memes, and pretty soon he had the likes of Scumbag Steve, Success Kid, and Ridiculously Photogenic Guy on his books. Or Blake Boston, Sammy Griner, and Zeddy Little, as they are actually called. But it wasn't just humans Ben represented. Of course, there was his original client, a beloved keyboard cat, but in 2012 he also signed perhaps his highest profile client of all, Tarda Sauce, also known, of course, as the legendary Grumpy Cat. He was the one responsible for getting Grumpy Cat her own film. Yeah, did you know Grumpy Cat starred in a feature length film? It's called Grumpy Cat's Worst Christmas Ever. I watched a couple of minutes of it once when I stumbled across it while flipping through channels, and not gonna lie, I wasn't surprised to find out that it has a 27% rating on Rotten Tomatoes. But enough about that. This isn't the Grumpy Cat episode, although that is absolutely on my list. I just thought it was interesting how Keyboard Cat led to Ben Lashes becoming the world's first meme manager. Like, nothing about that sounds like a real job, it's awesome. There was, of course, plenty of officially licensed Keyboard Cat merch, including an animatronic soft toy that played the iconic Keyboard Cat tune. They're no longer available, but oh, what I would not have given for one of them. You might think that Bento wouldn't enjoy his busy career as basically a feline influencer, but by all accounts, he really did. I mean, if he didn't, I doubt he would have tolerated being made to play the keyboard so many times. And what's clear is that he utterly adored Charlie, following him around everywhere and always wanting to be with him. Which makes it all the more tragic that Bento's life was cut short. On the 8th of March 2018, Bento died of liver cancer. Charlie said that it felt like he'd lost a piece of himself, and that he missed him the most at night, when Bento would always have come into the bed for a cuddle. And it wasn't just Bento's human family who were mourning his loss. His death was announced via a surprisingly moving YouTube video entitled Keyboard Cat to Bento a Tribute. And as soon as the internet learned that their beloved Keyboard Cat was no more, people started taking to social media to express their grief. Even Grumpy Cat herself tweeted in honour of him. A lot of people were genuinely heartbroken. It seems that a lot of people didn't realise that Bento wasn't the original Keyboard Cat. So then it was like double grief, when you learned that not only is the Keyboard Cat you knew and loved gone, but the original passed away decades ago too. As well as mourning the loss of Bento, a lot of people also began to speculate whether or not there'd be a third keyboard cat to continue the legacy, the same way Bento had done for Fatso. But Charlie told the Washington Post that he wasn't currently thinking about getting any more cats. Except psych! In March 2019, Charlie uploaded a new video, Keyboard Cat 3.0 Meet Skinny. Skinny? Who's Skinny? What happened to not getting another cat? Well, here's the team, my dudes. Skinny's always been there, waiting in the wings for his chance to shine. Frankly, I wouldn't be surprised if it was him who took out Bento. I mean, to be clear, Skinny is obviously not the same Skinny that was Fatso's sister. She has also long since passed. This is a new Skinny, named after the original. And Charlie adopted Skinny way back in 2010, not long after he adopted Bento. Remember that wonderful pistachios ad Bento did? Well, apparently they wanted Charlie to bring along two cats, even though they ultimately only used Bento. But Charlie didn't have two keyboard cats. So, once again, he adopted a ginger tabby. One with such a striking resemblance to Bento that I'm honestly not sure I could tell them apart. Skinny has the same white chin and paws, and is obviously wearing the famous teal blue keyboard cat shirt. 
although probably not the original Fatso one, as that's now framed like the piece of art history that it is, and is displayed proudly in Charlie's house. Watching some of Bento's videos, you can occasionally catch a glimpse of another cat's striped ginger tail in the background, which is Skinny. He was always there! And now Bento was gone, it was Skinny's turn to officially take on the title of Keyboard Cat. One of Skinny's first official engagements was in 2019, when he and Charlie were at Spokane Street Music Week, which is an event that raises money for a charity called Second Harvest, which works to fight hunger through various means. You could come along, get a selfie with Keyboard Cat and his human, and get an exclusive I Met Keyboard Cat badge in exchange for donating to the charity. And that just about brings us up to the present day. Skinny is still living his best life as Keyboard Cat, and their YouTube channel is still regularly uploading new content, though it's not really bringing in the numbers that it used to, as is the life cycle with internet memes. Keyboard Cat also recently joined Cameo, so if you want a personalised Keyboard Cat video, that's a thing you can go for. He also has one of those vinyl YouTube figurines that you can buy, as well as like two Keyboard Cat books, and the usual merch offerings of posters, canvas prints, soft furnishings, mugs, stickers, clothes, all that good stuff. That's also where you can buy some of Charlie's artwork, both Keyboard Cat related and not. And I have to say, he's a really talented guy. As is tradition, Keyboard Cat is also running for president in the upcoming US election, so I look forward to his inevitable victory. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode of the Animal Nerd Podcast. If you enjoyed it, please feel free to support the show in any way you can, it all makes a massive difference. Links to all of the sources used in this episode can, of course, be found in the show notes, as can all of our social medias and contact info, and of course, links to Keyboard Cat's various websites and socials, because I know you need more Keyboard Cat content in your life. New episodes of the show come out every single Tuesday, plus bonus minisodes at random intervals in between, so subscribe to make sure that you don't miss out on any of those. And because I don't think I've mentioned it for a hot second, this podcast isn't currently monetized, not even on YouTube, because although we have enough subscribers, we're lacking the watch time. But once it is, then 100% of any money it makes will go to the Little Rescue Zoo, which is an animal sanctuary specialising in exotic pets. So if you would like to share the show with people you know, or engage with our YouTube uploads to boost them in the algorithm, then that would mean the world to me, and it would go a long way towards my goal of being able to use this podcast to help rescue animals in need. Thank you already to everyone who has already gone out of their way to support the show, and thank you in advance to anyone who is going to. I appreciate it more than I can say, and I'm sure the animals do too. And thank you again for listening. I think I've done all the housekeeping that I need to do this week, so until next time, stay wild, friends!